Jason Quinn. Every mile and wide. Darren Pang just robbed him. Can't beat the heart of a lion and Kelly Chase. Roger is in alone. Shooting. Pang again. What a glove save. I know one thing. He's not going to back Kelly Chase up at all. Chase will fight this thing until he's absolutely out of gas. Oh, great play along the wall to start with. Just keeping the puck in. Shattenkirk with a quick decision. Schwartz bouncing on the puck. The save of the year. The absolute save of the year. Holy jumping. What a save this is. The pucker factor down on the Chicago bench is pretty, pretty high right now. Let me tell you. The Blues have stuck with the plan. The push was on. And that leaves the sniper off the bar and in the net. And that is our drive to the net. And why wouldn't it be? This is Jason Putts with Panger, only on NHLPodcast.com, a lineup media group production. Now, your hosts, Kelly Chase and Darren Pang. Hello, folks, and welcome in. Jason Pucks with Panger. Darren Pang, Kelly Chase, coming at you here for the next 45 to an hour having some fun with Darren Pang at Panger40 and at Chase and Pucks 39 our Twitter handles. If you want to, uh, of course, everyone knows how they can grab a hold of us, go to nhlpodcast.com. And uh, we're looking forward to a, a great show, a great show this week. We uh, Garth Butcher, Butcher is going to join us. So you're going to sit down with me one on one. We're going to have a 15 and 20 minute chat. <laughs> Some great stories of the former St. Louis Blues captain, Vancouver Canuck, of course, as well as the Nordiques and the uh, Toronto uh, Maple Leafs. So short stint there. Uh, this week we're going to talk. So Garth was in Toronto. Yeah, he was. That was his uh, last stop. No kidding, huh? Yeah, he was traded in the Wendell Clark Matt Sundin trade. I'll be darned. Yeah. Didn't even know that. Yeah. All yeah. I know is I like being around the guy. And in, in a brief amount of time, uh, he's being a ge- here... He's a gentleman. He is, isn't he? There was a lot of people that disliked Garth Butcher that didn't know that he was a gentleman. As a player. Was, as a player. Nah, yeah. that doesn't matter. What happens on the ice is on yeah, the ice, huh? Yeah, you know him well. Funny guy, too, huh? He is one of the funniest. Are you going to bring the listeners inside? I may... Uh, inside yeah, the locker room? Are you going to bring him inside his noggin? I may his bring noggin? him in. The fact he used to get uh, <laughs> Stu Grimson really going, and Stu's a wonderful <laughs> guy, a wonderful friend, but... He used to he, drive him crazy. He used to tell him his, he named, his parents named him Stu because they couldn't spell stupid. And <laughs> Stu used to say, Butch, I've had it with you. I've had it with you. And poor Grimmer, you know, he's just a nice guy. But he would hurt you too, Grimmer. He was tougher than barbed wire, you know. And, and uh, it was just constant banter like that that was hilarious. So you, you have to love the guy. But we're going to talk a little Steven Stamkos free agency. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the stars, the fighting, the fighting. The, there's stars fighting all over the, in the league now. So uh, we're talking about that. We're going to talk about, uh, we got a little background music for you folks too during the, for, during the show today because we're, uh, we're taping in our studio. Yeah. We've got an Amy Grant concert going on tonight and they're going to be doing sound checks with it. So we thought we'd add a little ambiance, uh, ambiance behind it. Uh, one of the officials said a little cursing. You know, what do you think of that? <laughs> did, I said a little did, bit of sound in the background. I didn't realize that they were pumping it in well, through the Hold the concert sound check, please. Uh, <laughs> Chasing Pucks with Panger is in progress right now uh, on NHLpodcast.com. We brought it up last week, John Scott in the All-Star Game, but I had a chance yeah. to talk to him. Yeah. So yeah, I want to I I bounce that by you. And, of course, Mark Messier and Wayne Gretzky were talking about the state of the game, three-on-three play, and it's discipline. So what do you think, Panger? What do you think? What do you think about this whole uh, state of the game with the... Uh, Mark Messier seems to think he likes the you know game what? right now. You know, I, I, you know, I spent a little bit of time, and, and I know Mark Messier and, and Gretz are, are great ambassadors to the game. You know, they've always put the game ahead of everything else. And, you know, the, the interesting thing with Mark was he, he thinks the game is good. He thinks the, the, passing, the passing's good, the execution's good, uh, the speed of the game's good. Um, and, and it's not unlike the, the era that he played in. There were going to be times where their games... Just you had off nights. The games weren't that good, even you know right. in the '80s and the right. '90s. And but uh, he see, he thinks overall uh, he likes the way the game is right now. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting about Gretz um, just talking about three on three. You, you know, it's funny that you and I had become good friends of his. And and, and every time there's a three on three game, or or if the Blues are in a three on three game, you get a text right away if he's watching the game because he's he gets fired up about it because right. it's three on three hockey. There's no coaching. Right. There's crisscrossing, there's patterns, there's two-on-ones, there's three-on-ones. And uh, can you imagine those old Edmonton Oilers, Chaser in that time? They gassed four-on-four. They had to ban four-on-four because the, 
the Edmonton Oilers were so good at dominating, they, they at, get at a making, penalty. making sure that the two guys went to the box yeah. four on four, and then then it was lights out. Curry, yeah. Meshe, Anderson, Gretzky, Coffee. I mean, come on, it wasn't fair. Yeah, no, I, and but but there always is things they want to tweak in the game, and I. And I, you know, the three-on-three, three, you're seeing the coaching. There's more coaching being involved in the three-on-three three now. All no, of a leave the coaches out of the three-on-three. No, three. I know, no, but, but there are. But though. there you are. are. They're all yeah. of a sudden, they, they're starting yeah. to say, let's put 2D out there and play for the shootout. We think yeah. we can win a shootout. The Islanders are a great example. They're defending during the three-on-three. Three. They're defending. Yeah. And then just killing teams on the shootouts. And you imagine with that team, they're defending th- for the three-on-three? Three. I know. But I did see Oposo on the, on the shootout. Oh, my God. That might that- might have been one of the sickest moves that, I, I've seen oh in a long time. Lord. That was like Pavel Datsuk reverse, was it not? No question. When you take it on the forehand, pull it on the backhand, yeah. and then then bring it back to the forehand, ba- uh, backhand forehand, up under the bar and in. That was unbelievable. Yeah, well, no wonder I guess they want to get it to the shootout. Right. Hey, but if it's three on three and he gets a breakaway, he can do the same move. He could... But there's a chance that there's going to be a turnover, and they don't want to have that. They're like, "Hey, let's defend. Defend. We'll defend. win." And that's their, that's the way they've been playing. So it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Amy Grant singing in the back. Ah, oh. isn't that beautiful? She has got a beautiful voice, huh? Oh my God! I I, a... I heard she wants me me to jump on stage and sing a couple of tunes. You guys are gonna tickle the ivory a little bit, play a little. You know, you know me. I'm really talented that way. Right. I can really belt it out. I was wondering what you were gonna say at the end of that. <laughs> She wants me to jump on stage. <laughs> the ivory. Uh, Tickle that, the ivory. That's great. That's great. Well, you know what? You're right. It is a good game right now. We're having a lot of parity in the league. You see teams yeah. running streaks. Florida's on a hot streak now. Free agency is something that we need to talk about because... UFAs? Complete free agency? 25-year-old Steven Stamkos is going to decide whether he wants to be the highest played player in the NHL or whether he wants to be a Tampa Bay Lightning, but it won't be both. Yeah, it won't be both. It won't be both. So, I would wh- have to think if he wants to be the highest paid, then he'll be somewhere else. Let's make this our Tweet of the Week. This will be our Tweet of the Week. Okay. Okay? Here we have it. The Tweet of the Week is a gentleman sends out something for Stamkos to keep in mind that he's going to be a free agent, you know, think about Toronto, and he favors the tweet. Oopsie. That could be our tweet of the week. It could be our dude, really segment. We're not sure which one that's going to fall in. We're not sure because, uh, but I do have the dude, really segment coming up. And but but like, what do you think about him doing that? What do you think? Do you think that's a little bit of a leverage play or not a smart play or what do you think? Just you like that tweet and the media blows up. You well, can't do of it. Of course it is. It's in Toronto. I mean, the tr- Toronto media is going to pick. I mean, it's crazy. And they're. The next time he comes into Toronto, which is soon, yeah. it's going to be overwhelming. Now he's going to be focused on everything but the game of hockey, and it takes away from his team. He's the captain of his team right now. He's not le- right now. He's a member of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and uh, you know. And maybe, it, maybe it was. Uh, I mean, I've s- seen the puck on his stick. He doesn't have bad hands, so oh. there's, <laughs> there's there's no way. I've seen the one timers. He's got good hands, um, but to. Uh, to, I mean, to do that is a real bad error uh, for all of Team Stamkos. For you know, for you know, Donnie Meehan's his agent. They've got a, you know, Gary Roberts is his strength guy. You've got Adam Oates is his skills guy. You've got him, you know, he and his family making this huge decision. Right. I'm sure it's overwhelming for him at times. But man, to to make that kind of mistake is uh, is uh, it's it's a bad it's it's just a bad it's you know. Uh, Whether it's an accident, whatever, Chaser, it's a bad mistake. Well, if it's an accident, he's done it two other times. Back in uh, in 2014, he did the same thing, commenting on Jonathan, uh, on uh, Johnny Travaris and him becoming free agents with the Leafs. That's right. And so it's it's twice you made the same mistake. I when call it, a little bit of BS. When does, it become, when does the league kind of come in here and say, whoa, 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 you know? I don't think you can, I think, you know, it was more about, him personally doing it so it's not like the league can say now what are they going to say you know, they can't tell you how you think your thought process here you're going to be an unrestricted free, free agent as long as he doesn't talk to the organization I think he's in pretty good shape I think he just um, did yeah well <laughs> he may have let them, call, let call, them know call me goofy but like it, but pressing like uh, on that tweet and favorited it mm. yeah no I know I agree with that too, it's too hard nowadays to be a young captain, you mentioned the parody, to lead, you know, your own team, to be the player that he wants to be, to, 
fulfill the expectations of Steven Stamkos just to add any kind of that main, what, what would you call it any, any kind of uh, not maintenance but it just it's well, too much other baggage that you got to deal you with. Don't you need, don't have you the don't, energy to yeah. deal with, if you, you know now, what I mean. Now you, right. Because now we're talking about it, and we're just a bunch of guys on a podcast talking hockey, and that's what a lot of people have talked about the last week. Right. Right. No. Well, you know, and 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 it, and it doesn't need to be talked about. You're right. Um, let's talk about this subject. It comes up a lot, and I'm sure we'll be we'll be talking, you know, um, a little bit about it uh, here in the future as well, but. We've all, fighting's just going to be a contentious uh, conversation with everybody, no matter how you look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, fighting now has become the, the all stars. Last week, I think, or two weeks ago, we talked about how much, how much more the top players in the league are being taken advantage of and run yeah. out. Yeah. Now we've transitioned into the top players fighting. Listen, listen to the names that we have fighting so far this year. That, that these are just the ones that I pulled up that I that I've looked at: Crosby, Giroux, Voracek, Taves, Ben, Perry, Stamkos, Malkin, and Tarasenko. Those are they're fighting. Now you think of a year when Gretzky, Lemieux, Iserman, at the quarterway mark, Hull. Holly. Hull Right? Well, he was picking up your gloves. Yeah, he, the closest he came to the fight was when he got an argument with the parking maid there at the <laughs> old arena. That was the closest. And uh, but I, I mean, that's a lot of top players, bud. That's a lot of top players. Well, they, you know, I think do maybe we have a little bit of um, a lacking of of teaching some of the players coming up that fighting not, may not be what the team wants you to do but fighting is parlaying hockey sense on the ice into doing the right thing hockey sense is is finding out what's going on in a scrum sticking around in that scrum for as long as you can stick around in that scrum and not pretending like nothing happened and and go away maybe the top players have said i've had enough of this i've had enough i'm getting you know i'm getting hacked and whacked in the old days chaser you wouldn't let that happen to brett hull no you're right you wouldn't you're right no, you wouldn't. And you wouldn't necessarily fight that guy right away, but you'd make sure that you targeted their top player or did something. Well, I, you know... We're not seeing enough of that right now, and our star players are taking a beating. I couldn't agree with you more, and, and I know that, you know, it's not going back, and we talked about it. I've talked about it with Brendan Shanahan when he was in the disciplinary uh, uh, area, and, and honestly, I just, I just don't, I don't... I don't understand the, the dynamic of it, to be honest with you. I don't understand why you'd want to have your top players... They're being bullied now, and guys that played the way I played stopped the bullying. Yeah. And and you, it's 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 a double-edged sword a little bit, and the league doesn't want to get in the middle of it because of all of the lawsuits. I understand, but Ch- you, Chaser, you're if, seeing more if, and more good players frustrated, but because they're being taken advantage of. And here, here's the thing that that you and I are both be, between the benches, and uh, the the thing about it is is a mid-tier player. A, 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 a second line left winger, a second pairing D that's not a, a, a tough guy, he doesn't have to go in and actually fight a guy either. Like that's, no. I mean, we're not selling the, he just has to get in there. You have to make sure you're, yeah, just get in there and look like you care about your teammate. Right, look like. That you, that you can't just do this and then go in and be, be a little bit somewhat involved so that, you know what, if you, listen, here's one thing analytics can't measure, the stomach it can't measure the stomach. It can't measure the fortitude. It can't measure the anxiety you have in the afternoon before a game because you're pressured to score, because you're pressured to defend, because of the fact you might have to fight. Fighting and being accountable changes the stomach. And you can't put numbers to your stomach and how a player reacts in a certain situation. Because if in that one game he has an off night, the other numbers cover for it. Mm-hmm. But the one off night that he has in a building can be the difference in winning and losing. And when you're not allowed to take care of or take advantage of top players in a building, it gives the top players an advantage. And that's what you want. You want your best players to be able to play, not be out with injuries, and not be having to fight. And I guess, okay, so I guess my point is that if you have a team that has a five-man, a five-man pack mentality, 
right? Always there, right. always buzzing around. Right. You know, in the scrums, always buzzing in and out. Then you likely don't have this issue. No, you're if, right. If well, all those, strong if, in numbers. Strong in numbers all the time. Strong in numbers, buddy. That's that's how you have to play the game. Yeah. But but still. So hold. these so these top players. Think about some of these guys. I've seen Jamie Ben fight before. He's a good fighter. Darn right, he's tough. Okay. I, uh, Jonathan Taves. We've seen Jonathan Taves and a number of top players go at it. Uh, uh, and he, he he's a good fighter too. Um, no question. Wh- which one of the group is a surprise of that? Well, Malkin. Yeah. Stamkos. Yeah. Tarasenko. Yeah, and Tarasenko, is, he, he's just such a strong ox. He can grab everyone. At least he can Voracek. tackle them down. Oh, Voracek. Voracek. Yeah, Giroux. That's right. Yeah. I, I, that doesn't surprise me with Giroux. Well, no, he's I know he's, he's a feisty spunk. guy. Yeah, no he's got question. some. Yeah, he's no, got I, some. I'm not trying to yeah. slight yeah. because I, I, I'm a huge fan. But I'm just saying, why is he doing it? Why does If he breaks his hand, he's one of the most dynamic players. And yeah. he shouldn't have to. You should not have to do it. And if you think that these guys care about a fine from the league, you are absolutely nuts. Yeah. Okay? You are. I think David Branch is way over the line with his suspensions in the Ontario Hockey League sometimes. And other times I understand them. I understand what he's trying to take out of the game. But David Branch, if I sat down and talked to that man, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, he has no idea what the stomach has on an impact in the day of a game. Now, you shouldn't be able to intimidate somebody to, to a certain point, but you should make enough of a difference mm-hmm. to not have your best players run at. He slayed out some of the biggest suspensions ever in hockey, and they still do it, and they're getting more and more frustrated with the game. So I have to tell you, there is, like you can say, oh, the change, there's, they're down. Yeah. The numbers, are, the suspensions are down. But you know what's up? You know what's up? Your best player is getting hit. And it's way up. getting hurt. Yeah. And getting hurt. Yeah. And, and I, I guess I'll go back to, I mean, I've known David Branch for a long time. And I respect and, him. i got to say that. Yeah, he was there in the Ontario League when I was there in 81. And he's uh, in a highly competitive marketplace to keep players from going uh, to NCAA and to, you know, let parents know that we're a good, we're, you know, we're good, safe league. This is a good option for your kids. We want them here in the Ontario Hockey League. Um, fine line. And I find very fine line into 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 uh, going the uh, going to the extent that that has happened there. It's a lot different than the old days. My first expansion team and was the Belleville Bulls. Right. We only had Craig Cox, uh, a guy named uh, Craig Kitchener, who's passed away since. Uh, um, we've had. Uh, just this average fighter named Marty McSorley at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think that's about what Dave Branch said. Okay, we, we're we going to change, change the this. rules. <laughs> Craig Cox, Craig Cox, and Marty McSorley from Cayuga, Ontario. Holy uh, smokes! What yeah. a group you guys. Ben know. Kelly. Oh, we had some. Yeah, we had uh, Ali Buderak. Yeah, that's even a tough-sounding name, isn't it? I know. We, we, had a, we had a fairly fun show in Saskatoon. We had uh, Twist, Kosher, Clark, Chase, Kaminsky. We had Brian Glynn, Curtis Lasician playing D for us. And we were big and mean. You think? Yeah. Sean Van Allen was our scorer. He had over 100 points, and he came to the league a lot of room, checker. He, I'll tell you what, he was, a, he was a much better offensive guy on our team than he was anywhere else because boy did we make sure nobody laid a hand on him he was all we had him and Kevin Kevin Kaminsky was a heck of a player in junior um, Corey Kosher was a first round pick yep. so he you know, he was a heck of a and we had some sluggers out there boy but I'll tell you what it was uh, it was a different time a different era and I, I know we'll never get back to that yeah no but it's still about it's still about the hockey sense of, of it's a team sport and in a team sport you, you, you stick up for one another you stay tight uh, you make sure that one player's not on an island one player's not out there and there's three of the other team even hovering around them you yeah. make sure you're all right there same thing I used to say when when the other team and this is a, a different kind of hockey sense chaser and I'll kind of segue but when another team um, another team's captain is having a you know a 30 second conversation with the referees right and none of your players let's say are, get, or are you, over you there watch, not knowing what's going on or you can watch any game in the NHL and anytime I see it I go Man, why isn't that? Why isn't the other team going there and listening to, to to what he's saying? Or, or let's say a coach is having an extended conversation uh, on one side with with the referee. I mean, I I would always have my captain or whoever get over there and find out what the heck they're talking about, so we're not missing out on the edge here or or right, what advantage right. they're trying to secure on that side. Right. That's all just hockey sense, isn't it? 
no different than when I say a, a goalie that can't play a two-on-one. Does he know it's a right-hand shot or a left-hand shot? Does he know he's a passer? Do, does he know he's a shooter? Do he know who's that's a That's doing your homework. Doing a, who's a grinder. That's just doing your homework. Doing your yeah. homework. That's just what, do your homework. That's what we love about the game. All right. Well, listen, I think they got Vince Gill's music going right now. Really? It's a little louder. Is this when I'm A little bit more there? boom. We got it in the background here to get down at Scott Trade here in the, in, uh, the uh, lovely McBride and Son home suite. So nice. we're going to uh, we're gonna take a quick break and be back in a minute with you. It's Darren Pang. I'm Kelly Chase. Chasing pucks with Panger on NHLpodcast.com. Hey, guys. It's the Ocho Man with the show Ocho Man Behind the Eight Ball. What can I say? This show covers it all from sports, politics, whatever's out there of interest. We cover it all. Our co host, we got Darman. I definitely feel that he's got a bomb shelter somewhere with right wingers hanging out, ready to take over the world. And on the other end here, I got uh, Nick. Uh, Nick's an alien. I really believe that Nick landed on this planet to uh, re educate us all, you might say. Again, check our show out every Friday. I'm sure you'll love it. Also, to find out more about our show, go to ochoman.com. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Behind the eight ball. All my life, that's where I've been. It's yeah, like you a... don't matter. You can't have it on a plane. You're on the Polar probably, Express. Probably. You're on a no, sled. No, I'm saying that they keep it with them traditionally or whatever. You can't have that on a train or a plane or anything like that. Fuck you. I don't care what you got. I don't want you with a knife on a train or a plane or anything. Are you okay uh, with the beard? I'm okay with the beard. Mm-hmm. You can have your beard, but just don't dunk it in my soup or anything. <laughs> Now, back to Jason Bucks with Panger on the Lineup Media Group Podcast Network. Back here with Darren Pang. I'm Kelly Chase, Jason Bucks with Panger. Well, buddy, we've had an uh, interesting week around the league. Lots of good stuff going on. Uh, some little, little bit of, you know, controversial, maybe a little story here and there we could talk about. One of the uh, good news stories and feel-good stories of the week is uh, the story from uh, Edmonton. They're honoring Glenn Sather. I know, isn't that something? It's awesome. You know, I mean, he, he was he was a mastermind of, of that dynasty. Um, you talk to any one of their guys, and the uh, just the way he handled the young players at that time, how he could had the ability to kind of put his arm around them and still kick them in the groin at the same time, and how to keep them on the straight and narrow. Um, I always thought this was just my opinion, okay? Right. And I, I got called up in eighty four, eighty five. I got called up in the. I was the third goalie, and, and the, the, uh, the Blackhawks played a heck of a couple of series. Uh, uh, beat Minnesota, you know, in a couple of overtimes. And anyway, kind of got all the way to the conference finals, and, and, and it was the highest scoring playoff series of all time, uh, Chicago and Edmonton. And, and it was funny that all the guys in the Blackhawks, they would go by Glenn Sather. <laughs> and if you go back in the history of quotes, they they all thought he had this cocky smirk on his face, <laughs> the scar. <laughs> yes, and 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 they would just give it to him over there, and even guys would publicly say things. And then Slats finally had to come out and say, "What are you talking about? I always look that way. I got this scar in my face." But the way he looked at the players exactly. made you feel like there was okay. What's going on with this guy? What's what's this smirk on his face? But and, don't didn't you look at him and a guy like Scotty Bowman as well? And wonder what they were thinking about lots of times. All the like, time. Oh, I, 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 me too. All the time. I, I'd look over on the. He intimidated me. Yeah. I, I was intimidated by two people. Well, three on that bench. I was intimidated by Dave Semenko. I was intimidated by Mark Messier because he was my favorite player in the NHL. And I was absolutely for sure intimidated by. By Slats? By Slats. Huh. Uh, I mean, he. There's something about him. I'm thinking that, you know, maybe that he had the respect of all of the players like he did, the way he. He carried himself the way they were successful. I guess that's what intimidated me about him. But he had this, and I'd love to see that the guys are all there honoring him. The yeah. great players that are there, you know, Fuhr and, and, and Mess and, and uh, Gretzky and Coffee and those guys, when they get together, imagine, the, imagine how much fun that group has with the great, because cha- championship teams stick together, right? Can you imagine the great stories? And, and I mean, I remember Wayne talking and telling this story about how um, 
Slats used to, he loved Dave Samico, but he would get on him a lot, you know, because I guess Dave was a little bit of a, you know, he liked to have a little bit of a good time or whatever. And he used to say, he said Slats one time, uh, he had hurt his knee and he had, had to do some re rehab stuff and that. So they gave him a program that consisted of push-ups, sit-ups, and running. That was his off-season off work. And he, he called, Slats called Dave and said, hey, how's the, how's the knee, or how's the, uh, training coming he goes ah he goes push-ups and sit-ups are fine but this this running he goes he goes oh the knee bugging you he goes no my cigarette keeps going out <laughs> <laughs> the old smoke it, it keeps coming <laughs> so, so they say the, the old guy, yeah sure it's the way he tells his story about how how dave Semenko said he wanted three things that he wanted to be on the cover of hockey news um he wanted to get a hat trick in the nhl and he wanted just one, he goes, and he got a hat trick. He was on the cover of the Hockey News. And the third thing he wanted was Slats to walk in just one day and say, Mess, Gretz, Sammy, take the day off. <laughs> <laughs> Said never got the third. Never got the third. <laughs> Maybe Slats can, can do that on, on this great weekend that they're going to have. And isn't it, you know, the Rangers are in, in town. And, uh, you know, it, I, I think there was a time where it wasn't highly amicable. And I, I think time heals a lot oh, yeah. of things. And um, I, I just admire that the, the Oilers have always paid great tribute. Well, I was a member of the broadcast team in, uh, in Phoenix when, when Wayne was coaching. It seemed like everywhere we went, they were retiring a sweater. And they, they always organized it when Wayne was there. Sure. Um, in L.A. with Luke Robitaille, where I'm, I swear he ran out of batteries three times. He went so long. Um, <laughs> then uh, I, in... Um, in it was Glenn Anderson, Paul Coffey. Yeah. You know those were the those were the nights that we uh, we were there, and uh, and Wayne, God bless him as a coach. He he made those players, he he made them understand how important this was, yeah. and had them on the bench. Yeah. You know when you see most teams, that drives me crazy. Hey, Do you I, know the Anaheim Ducks when Steve Eiserman's sweater was retired that they stayed in the room. They stayed in the room. And old Berkey, and I'll never forget this, and we all love Brian Burke, but he was complaining afterwards in the hallway because I am seated. Right. And, and I, it, it, sure, it was long, yeah. but Steve's one of the greatest players that's ever played, no and, and he's owed that. And if it's 10 minutes too long, so be it. The game, the, nobody even remembered the game anyway. Right. But I remember, the, you know, Anaheim complaining that, that it went a little bit long. And, and, and in the meantime, in the speech, there's Eiserman thanking the Anaheim Ducks, you, you know. But anyway, Gretz would always make sure that the players were always right there. And, and, uh, and so this is going to be really neat. You know, when I, I, I one time, I didn't really know Slats. And I, you know, and, and unless you play for a man and, and are with a man all the time, you don't really know him. We might know him from the media or me personally, know him from being around certain events. And I, and I wasn't sure, you know, how Slats perceived me or how, you know, did he... You don't know who he respects or who he doesn't respect sometimes, huh? Well, Chaser, you, don't kind of, know if, you don't even know where you stand. In my case, you, you don't stand. know if he knows you. And then you he says hello to you, and then you're like, yeah. oh, that was nice of him. And then he yeah. sees you in the hallway 10 minutes later, and he goes, how you been, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> Calls Tony me Twist. Tony Twist. <laughs> well, and, then, and then I start chatting with him. He goes, I don't know why I just called you Tony. You're your chaser, and, you know, so yeah. it's nice to talk to him. But well, one time I was, I was, Grant Fuhrer was doing, had a great golf tournament in Vancouver. It's shocking that I was at a golf yeah, tournament weird. with really uh, weird. with uh, with Grant Fear. And so we're there, and afterwards, this is you know, it's a great uh, fundraiser, and and there's paintings going on, and there's guys are throwing around money, and there's you know, and, and there's slats. He flew he flew to be there, and yeah. he's a busy guy, but he got there, and the late Pat Quinn was there as well, and they sat there all night. They had their wives, and I learned a little something about that man, about Glenn Saylor that night that. Uh, People wouldn't know that, but he he, he must have spent fifty, eighty thousand dollars. Really, just kept got that picture for thirty. You know, raised money for this. Did some donated something. You know that that was going to be auctioned off. That was out of his own. That was out of his own That's pocket for Grand too. Fear. That to me was a, it. Really, uh, I sat there and had a couple of cigars and a couple of cognacs with him after that. <laughs> I asked him it. why he never traded for me. I thought I could be a good backup to Fear. But anyway, it was a, a nice I could have been a good backup to Fear. <laughs> yeah, he only played 79 of the 80 games. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a neat thing to see him and how much he cares about his players. Right. Truly cared about his players and kept them all together and kept them winning. And I, I just, uh, great admiration for that whole group of guys. 
I think I have the, a, 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 a real appreciation when they did the story on on Gretzky's trade and the, and the last the last time I've seen it done when he just talked about how he I mean he was mad and him and he almost left Edmonton because of, of what was going on and how he yeah. you know he he Pocklington and, and him w- were you know they Mark were not seeing eye to eye on that oh they were fighting and it was it was it was unbelievable so you know for a guy to be honored he should be honored in Edmonton he he's uh, he's had a successful career as an administrator and as a coach he played he was a journeyman that played I think on seven teams. The Blues were one of them. The huh? Blues were one of them, and uh, Rangers and, and the Rangers. Boston. Yeah, there was he. Well, I'm going to go seven. Then. Yeah. Okay, seven. I Pittsburgh, I think, was one of them. Yeah, as well. I agree like, with that. But yeah. but so you you're looking at a guy that, you know, he he's done it. He's had a he's had a tremendous career, and I think, you know, when you look at that, when you look at a guy that's that's done and accomplished everything he's accomplished, everybody's going to have their story about him. But I but I can assure you, the one thing that's the most common theme is that. He got the best out of a group. He knew what his core group was. He knew how to bring in pieces every year just to fit in the puzzle. So they had a chance to win. And when he accomplished that, I think it's easier. It's not easier to win, but you have a better understanding of what it takes once you won. And I think that Slats had that great understanding of how to do it. And he always, always gave them the opportunity, the best opportunity to do it by the trade deadline to win with those teams that he had. Yeah, it was always about winning oh. and, and always putting the right pieces together. Um, even that hockey, you know, even the hockey trade. I mean, thinking of trading Paul Coffey, uh, and some of it's contractual, um, and had to make a hockey decision. But bringing, I think it was Craig Simpson that came in that deal, right, from Pittsburgh. That's right. End up scoring 50 goals and uh, winning a cup as well, or two. So um, never easy running a team. You're not always going to give the players the right answers or the answers that they want, but you're doing it for the right reasons so you can lift the Stanley Cup. So when they go into their new rink, do they take Gretzky's old statue? from this rink now and move it there or do they bring another statue and then do they have the, they've got to have Slats a statue there I mean as the architect as you enter the building you've well, got to have Wayne Gretzky's yeah well I, I imagine they move the statues but the amount of uh, ceremonies that we do in our league now they might just do have uh, they might go through the whole six pro, six different ceremonies for six different statues again and put them up there. You never know. <laughs> statues, they're going to re-retire jerseys. Who knows what they're going to do? But certainly sl- Slats belongs in that. And uh, um, what a what a tremendous uh, slight to him. We're going to take a little break. We're going to be right back. It's NHLpodcast.com, Chasing Pucks with Panger. You want to find us on Twitter, it's at NHL Show. Facebook, facebook.com slash NHL Show. And at nhlpodcast.com to email us so you can uh remember you can check out all our shows on lineup media groups for shows like ochi man behind the eight ball you're on the clock let's get it on on mma with big john mccarthy great show this week with big john coming up they are going to be talking a little bit about uh there's some controversy going brewing uh uh, in the boxing arena with uh, Big John. going to be doing the big fight that's this weekend as well. And Sean Wulak, of course, on with him. So, uh, so folks, we'll be back in a minute. Darren Pan, Kelly Chase on Chasing Bucks with Pan. Hey, this is Big John McCarthy. And this is Sean Wheelock. Be sure to join us every week for Let's Get It On as John and I bring you the inside view of MMA and combat sports. On this week's program, Big John and I will speak with Trisha Morrison, the widow of former WBO World Heavyweight Champion Tommy Morrison, who had his boxing license suspended by the Nevada Commission in 1996 for a positive HIV test, which effectively ended his career in boxing. Trisha Morrison vehemently denies that her late husband ever had the HIV virus and will tell us why she's filed a civil lawsuit in an effort to prove this in court as well as the court of public opinion. You can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, let's get it on podcast.com. The widely accepted version of events is that your late husband, Tommy Morrison, contracted the HIV virus and ultimately died due to full-blown AIDS. But I know that you feel that this is completely false. Um, well, it, it is completely false, yes. Do you believe that there is an illness that is called HIV or AIDS? Um, Do you believe you know that what? that the, illness the is real? Be? 
They could be, but let me tell you, so really it did no. not exist. It, like, I'm not a physician, but let me tell you, it did not exist in Tommy Morrison. Here we are, chasing pucks with Panger, NHLpodcast.com. I'm joining my good buddy, Garth Butcher. And hey, man, uh, we were talking about this prior to coming on and, and saying, listen, I, I don't know anything about these podcasts, but all I knew is, is that uh, when you can sit around, you know, shoot it with the uh, buddies of yours and tell stories, that's all we do now. That's all we have now, Butch. Well, it is, but uh, it is pretty fun. And I, I think that uh, lots of people would like to be hanging over our shoulders sometimes when we are telling some of the stories. <laughs> And uh, the nice part is the stories get bigger and better as the, as the years go by, but it's it's still the same cast of characters. It's pretty fun. You're in town in uh, St. Louis right now for uh, the captain's night, and, and that's a special thing. Obviously, uh, I, I know you're honored. You were honored to be a captain, and you were always a leader. But but to see the group of guys that are coming in and, and to be around them, that's got to be a little bit. That's pretty neat too. Yeah, you know what? It is. It's it is a it was a real honor, and it it, it continues to still be an honor, and it it kind of. I reflected on a little bit this week coming and, uh, you know, I thought, uh, and the guys we had in that, that team chaser, it was pretty easy to be a captain of that team. I mean, we had, we had 20 of them. We had, we had, we had remarkable characters. We didn't have guys that you had to get in line or whatever. They, they all got it. They came to play. Um, you know, I, I loved our teammates for that year. Well, you know, it, uh, when you, when you look at, you know, kind of the game, the way the games evolved, are you happy with the state of the game? Um, you've never been a guy that's ever been bitter. I remember when you retired, you said, hey, it's someone else's turn. I said, yeah, but you could have played here, here. And you're like, nah, you know what? I've had a good run, and it's someone else's career. I, I played as hard as I could. And So what's your thoughts on the state of the game? You know what? I, I, uh, there's always always things that can be done that's different. I mean, first of all, you know, as you said, a, a player you left, and you know, it was sad some guys leave, and, and they think they, they want to play longer, and they don't get a chance. And myself, I, you know, I, I was fortunate to choose my time, and I, I'm still happy about that. And I'm um, still really, you know, proud of what I did, but also, you know, feel the game treated me great and continues to this day to, to uh, keep rewarding me. And, um, you know, the state of the game, you know, you never want to talk bad about current players or ex-players or different things like that. I mean, I think the guys today are, are amazing athletes. I, I think that the work and, and the preparation that they put into it are uh, – are amazing and, and they're true professionals. Um, you know, I think a little bit gets lost now in the uh, the personal touch of you know the hockey players are always guys that whether you were a, whether you're with the media or whether you were a fan that you could always uh, latch on to a certain guy in a team that was was really just like you. I and mean, if you were a normal guy, um, there was somebody on that team that grew up like you did or, or or did what you did or brought to the table what you do in your line of work. And I think that's. Uh, part that's that's missed a little bit and it's not it's not the guy's fault it, it's it's the guys are kind of have been sheltered and kept away from it a little bit more and where you and I we walked into the guys in the street and whether we sat down beside them and, and bellied up and <laughs> had a nice cold Budweiser with them or no we, we uh, never did any hardly any of that no no well they were and yeah we'd we, have a coffee and right water and head whatever, over to a Pilates so, class yeah yeah well well you know what we uh we played with some great characters of the game. One of the one of the guys that was brought up last night when we were chatting was Brian Sutter, and uh, he, he was just one of those tough. I remember him. He used to punch me in the ribs before games. I'd come up behind you, punch you in the ribs, and say, "Hey, lad, are you ready, lad? You ready?" And then one time he came up behind me and he punches me in the ribs and he says, "Hey, kid, you watch that Dave Brown tonight? He's all left." And I'm thinking. I don't care if he's left, right? I'm not going near Dave Brown. He's all left. Like, I'm going to fight with him. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll have my eye on him. <laughs> but what a character he was. Yeah, well, Brian, you know what? Brian, to me, and uh, one of my favorite coaches of all time. And I know that, you know, some guys thought Brian was hard and, and he was, uh, um, you know, a little too tough on guys or different things like that. You know, I really thought what Brian brought is I thought he brought honesty. I, I thought it was... I thought he was hard, but but I thought he was honest and fair. Fair, yeah. And uh, um, I know Brett Brett Hull, who you would think would be the exact opposite of a guy who would be a Brian Sutter I type player. Him. He made he made Brett yep. helped helped make Brett yep. the player he became. And uh, and uh, Hully will admit that to you, you know, to this day. You know the story, right? At the end of the year, right? Yeah. You want to tell? Yeah. You should tell that. Right? Yeah. Well, I, Hully goes he goes something like this: at the end of the year, we always had our our exit meetings and and whatnot, and. 
Brett went in and sat there and put his feet up on the desk like he always does and, yeah. and uh, expected Brian to sing his praises of what an amazing, I think it was a 41 goal breakout season. It was uh, 46, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. He had a breakout season and he thought this was it and and, uh, and uh, Brian Sutter basically looked at him and told him that he was lazy and that he was out of shape and that he was not as good as he could be and he had no idea how good a player he could be and that he was leaving a lot on the table basically and that if he thought he was going to get a hand, you know, get a pat in the back for that season, he had another thing coming. And uh, of course the history shows that Brett came out the next year and scored 86. So 72, 86. 72 and then 86. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Brian was right. I don't think, I don't know if Brian even shook his hand after 72. He probably told him he needed to get more <laughs> after that too. So <laughs> He was a driving character in the game. One of the things I had fun with though is, is the Sutter's, uh, uh, the two brothers play and Richie and Ronnie played for us. And of course, Brian was our coach and, and it had to be a little tough on unnerving on them. They didn't speak sometimes for away from the rank for weeks. And it was crazy the way these guys had this relationship. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And well, and of course, Brian was, was very well respected amongst the family and yeah. Richie and Ronnie being the youngest and, and whatnot like that. Like yeah. they, they kind of had to bow down to him a bit and, and uh, but it was even quite funny, and we told a couple stories last night about when we were playing against the other yeah, Sutters. Yeah, yeah. And there's some mixed feelings, and and I know that you know, like whether it be you or I or whatever, we'd be beaten on Brent or whatever it was, and going on and so Dwayne. forth, and and Dwayne and and all the other little nicknames they had, and I, and I know that Brian kind of loved it, you know, but it had but, to eat him up. Had to eat him up. I, Richie and Roddy were a little softer. I don't want to say nicer guys, but softer guys. Yeah. And, I know it bothered them kind of a lot, you yeah. know. They weren't exactly giving the SNA hints as to which hand Brent Sutter threw punches with. <laughs> of course, I think when we fought him, he didn't get to throw many. No, anyway. that's right. <laughs> Boy, I, I told you that story uh, we were talking about last night. Remember when we were there, and I ran into Eddie Balfour on the ice, and, of course, there was a little bit of a storm that went on after that. And and uh, Dwayne Sutter happened to be the guy that I ended up fighting, and I tuned him in pretty good. And, and he ended up with the instigator. So not only did he lose the fight, but he – he gets a two-minute penalty, and we score in the power play. And so I'm already in the box. When he comes out of the penalty box, I'm in our bench. And he's screaming at me and hollering and cursing and telling me how he's going to get me and my family and everybody I know and all this. And finally, I told him to sit down. He said, shut your mouth. You can't even be – he said, you must be adopted. You're not even tough. <laughs> and I, and the, the two twins were howling. They thought it was funny. And Brian kicked me so hard in the ribs and told me to get my head in the game. And I felt like saying, that is my game. That's the <laughs> that's, best part of my game. The best part of my game is my mouth, right? And, and the fighting. And, and here you are, you know, he was – so you knew there was some uh, personal emotions in there. Wow. But you did talk about a guy that, that, uh, that we all know real well and, and, and had a terrific career. It was just amazing watching Brett Hall accomplish what he did as a player and, and, and some of the – I mean, just traveling into a city in the lineups for autographs and – I mean, he was the best player in the world at that time. Yeah, he truly was. And it was, and what was interesting to watch is that the other teams knew it. It yeah. wasn't like, you know, whatever, it was three quarters of the way through the season and he had 60-some or 70. Yeah. And, and he was still find a way to get open. And, and uh, it's actually funny, the other day I had an interview, and, you know, of course, for guys like you and I, what we always get asked is, you know, who was the toughest guy ever right, played right. against, you know, that, that, that kind of and, and I, I guess you relate, relate to it different now when you look at it, and there was – there was there was guys that you knew if you were in a fight that it was going to be trouble. Right. But there was also guys you played against that were that were tough. And you know they asked me to bring up a couple of names. And I brought Al Secord as a guy who was scoring fifty in those days and was like scary to play against in the right. little Chicago stadium right. things like that. But but then I brought up Brett's name as well and I said like there's a guy who yeah. was tough. No and, question. And he his way to get away from me when I was playing against him before I was on the Blues when I was in Vancouver was just to. Shrug his shoulders and drop his drop his stick down and and let it go and then you forget about him for a second and of yep. course he loves loves to point out to me the next thing you know the puck's in the net You're right and and that was his way but he he took punishment from guys in, in an era when when guys were allowed to give punishment you know like using we, aluminum sticks using aluminum sticks you could you could beat on a guy with an aluminum stick and he scored seventy two eighty six in those goals in that era and what I find. You're 100 percent right. What I when I say that about people, I, I say I, I talk about the very same thing you're you're talking about about Brett Hall being one of the toughest guys I ever played with. We all know about the fighters. I always talk about you know Joe Koser being what I thought was the scariest guy to play. Him and Dave Brown and no and I always say this no disrespect to Bob Probert because he's so well thought of and known as far as fighter. But but and I fought Bob a lot of times as did you and I never. 
ever worried about him hurting me, whereas one of those other two guys could end your career. Yeah. But yet, Brett Hall, you mentioned his name in a sentence with tough, and they're like, what do you mean tough? And I, he never went in the training room, took a heat pack and stretched on the floor. He's one of the most flexible athletes I've ever seen in my life, which is unbelievable when you, the body shape and type of them, right? <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> yeah, flexible is probably not the first word that comes no, to mind. No, when you look right? at him, I, did, I can tell you a story. Gretzky challenged him to a yoga contest in a restaurant. Wayne did. And I bet, I said, there's no way, Gretzky, there's not a chance you were going to win this. And, uh, and he's like, are you kidding? And Kirk Muller was, you know, he's Switzerland and everything anyway. But Kirk, he, he didn't really. And he goes, Holly, I'm sorry. I got to bet against you. Holly, it wasn't even close. Holly is just, you know, the flexibility of him. So he just stayed in the locker room, never went in the training room put the heat packs on and played through injuries all the time and just played yeah. and never had to worry about whether Brett Hall was going to show up to compete in a, in a, in a game. And, uh, I talk about, you know, but speaking of who, who, who were the other guys that you said, you know, some of the tough, because there's guys you play with that people are like sneaky, good, sneaky, tough. Who were those guys that you respected as playing through that kind of stuff? Well, like you said, like Brett, the one thing you, you forget is that it, it, there wasn't a complaint. And there wasn't like a whole bunch of drama in the change room. It was like, oh, God, and, you know, there's drama up to the game. Some guy's like, oh, Jesus, he could be able to go. He's really hurt. And next right. thing you know, he's flying around the rink. And you're right. looking at him going like, man, I can't even move. But, right. like, but uh, you know, so obviously guys like Brett, um, you know, Oats, Oatsy was another guy who was, you know, just – Slight in structure, right? the right. stature is just yeah. is is if you if you walk by in a business suit, you would not say the guy's a hockey player right. in any way, shape, or form. Um, but just a truly you know intense, tough individual who who went in the hard places to, yeah. to make the passes he made, right. and, and he was he was making those little backhand saucer passes with two hundred and twenty five pounds of angry man coming at him, right. and uh, a lot different than a golfer standing up on the tee and hitting the shot. You right. know, he he uh, <laughs> he was truly. And with without you could tell when there's fear in a guy's eyes. He never had it. There was right. all he was doing was looking for an open guy. That's all he cared about. So, that, that, you know. that, that's true. At 100 uh, percent, the way he played. I always say Chris McAlpine, and I'll tell you why. I know you didn't play with Chris, but he he was one of those guys that I had a tremendous amount of respect for because of how he played the game. He played hard. I've probably seen him fight a couple times, maybe a year, once, maybe twice. But it wasn't the fighting part of it that I thought he was tough. But one year, which which really just stands out in my mind as the epitomizes hockey players was he broke his foot and he knew his foot was broke so he broke the foot and he doesn't take his skate off you know how that goes you take your skate off and it all balloons up his whole thought process was i'm going to come in the locker room i'm going to put this skate on or take the skate off and i'm going to have to put it right directly in ice so he took all his other equipment off and was sitting down and he went in the training room and he unzipped and buckled and that foot we were watching and it just it was it was it was like somebody had a bike pump and a flat soccer ball and it just went whoo and yeah. just blew up and his foot's broken so he pumps it in the ice and eventually go gets x-rays and he walks out and crutches in a boot and we're playing three days later against the LA Kings in the first round of the playoffs and he wants to play and Joel Quinville's like you know you're not gonna be able to play he goes let me just try it let me just try it so this guy goes out now he played he was a he was he played High school football, could have been a football player, a linebacker, and he, and he was a catcher in baseball, and he's a defenseman in hockey, chose hockey, and financially not maybe the smartest move, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, he, and, he, and he goes out and plays and, and skates with a, with a larger skate on and plays, and he plays the entire first round of the playoffs. And, when they, and, 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 the, and you know, he would get the Novocaine to put, uh, we're not supposed to say that anymore, that you got to actually froze to play, but put... Between his big toe and his, and his next toe was where the first shot went, and the next one down the side of his foot, and then in the instep. Yeah. And he would just hold on to the training table, and the sweat would be coming off him, and then fine. And he'd giggle a little bit when he was done, and he'd be, he played. Played four games. We won. We swept L.A. He went into the hospital to get it checked at the end, and he said, check my wrist, and he had a broken wrist. He'd been taping his own <laughs> wrist since January. Yeah. So... You know, when people say, well, who's one of the toughest guys you ever played with? They're expecting you to talk about fighting. Yeah. That's one of the toughest guys I've ever seen. When you can play like that, that's, that's, that's truly something uh, that, I, that I think is special about it. You, you played, you, you came up, you were the youngest guy that ever played on, or the, to play with the uh, Regina Pats at the time. You guys went on to the Memorial Cup, I believe, correct? Yeah. And then, and then you know, you go on and, and, and skip that minor league experience, thankfully. Uh, most of it. Most yeah. of it. But yeah. you but you play in Vancouver right away. 
what was it like as a young guy to just kind of, you know, all of a sudden you, you're like, because we all grew up in Canada, that's a dream. Yeah. You know, and there's only been 7,400 people in the history of the game that ever got to live that dream. So if you, you know, over the hundred and some years of the game, that's a small amount. So what, what was that like? Well, you know what, it, uh, you know, as a young guy, and, you know, we're still, uh, I, geez, I think I'm smarter than I was last year. You know, as a young guy, <laughs> you don't, you know, obviously it was, it was super great, but I don't, I don't think you uh, understand how, how great it is and how exceptional it is and, and what a great opportunity is for someone. Um, you know, for me, it was just, uh, um, it's actually, I'll tell you a little funny sidebar to the story. Growing up in Regina, Saskatchewan, it was really close to where you grew up as well. You do like, there was guys who played at the Regina Pats who were in the NHL, and there was my dad's right. friends who owned Billy Hickey, who owned the sporting goods store in town. He played in the NHL, and those were those were those were people I saw and knew, and so I just figured that's what I would do. There wasn't really, you know, I didn't know the path, I didn't know what I should be doing. I right. just figured that's, just, that's the way. That's what's pretty much going to happen here. And, right. And, uh, it works. Actually, funny story. I'm coming through the border crossing. I live I live in Washington State now. I was going up into British Columbia to watch uh, my boys' hockey game one night and uh, go through the border crossing. And uh, the lady looks at me and she goes, well, Garth, when she sees my ID and she says, uh, um, I went to elementary school with you. And I said, you're kidding. She goes, yeah, I know, you signed my yearbook. I said, uh, oh, that's, that's, that's really cool. I'm sorry I don't recognize you. She goes, no, you signed my yearbook. Garth Butcher, I'm going to play in the NHL. <laughs> well, you said, she said, you're in grade eight. Really? Yeah, and I and I said I don't know whether to say I'm embarrassed by that story, by how cocky I was, or 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 laugh at it. But it was just it was it was remarkable. A lady that I hadn't seen in obviously you know at that time, you know, 40 years. And uh, did so, she age better than you? Well, I uh, you know not according to my eyes, <laughs> but uh, you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yes, in case she's listening, she was a beautiful lady, as 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 all well, of them. She's going to download all this. of them from Regina. Work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, true story. And I, I laughed. Like I said, I was just going, man. It, it's just uh, that's 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 how we thought it was, you know. And and, I, and then you get there, and, and you go, well, you know, this is just what I'm supposed to be. Here I am. Yeah, here I am, and whatnot, and. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, like I said, it, you know, you look back at the years and, and especially I think for the guys you, you play with and played with in junior and even minor hockey where you go, wow, that guy was a terrific player. That guy could do this. This guy could do that. And, and then you see, you know, how far they make it or don't make it or different things like that. You, you really have to have, you know, I, I believe that everybody, you know, they, they earn, they earn what they, what they get, but by the same token, you need some breaks along the way and you need some good luck and you need some, you know, good people supporting you as well to, you know, you can't do it on your own. You had an opportunity to play in Vancouver, as they said. You come to St. Louis, and then and then there's a trade from St. Louis where uh, you end up being involved, going to Quebec City, and, and uh, that was a tough day. I mean, yeah, it was a tough day. It was, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you try to remind guys now. At at, uh, at the time, you know, you talk about playing through injuries or different things like that. It was uh, we were coming up to the All Star break. And uh, I knew the All-Star break was coming. I knew I was going to get the time to rest. And I was, I was basically playing on uh, uh, wrapping both groins for the last two weeks before. And I, and I was not playing well. But, I, of course, as a, you know, not the smartest guy in the world, I refused not to play. And I wanted to play. And, and I figured once I got through the All-Star break, it would be, uh, it would be okay. Well, I think Mr. Caron thought I wasn't playing good enough, so he traded me. <laughs> and I wish, uh, but, uh, but at the time, you know what, we had really, you know, you, you know better than anybody and uh, the, how much I love St. Louis and how much I love playing in St. Louis. And, and by the same token, my wife, Tana, said the other day she, when we talked about us coming back, she goes, you know, if you look back on our life, like those were, you know, some of the best times ever, you know, and uh, whatnot. And that uh, we, we yeah. really, really did enjoy it. So, like, I quite frankly said no when they, they told me about the trade. And Bob Berry, our coach, said no. And Teddy Sater, like they, like um, I think the only guy in the room that wanted it was uh, was Mr. Caron and uh, whatnot, which of course made me feel good. My teammates all said no, and I, you know, at the time it was. Yeah, I remember uh, it, was it was a hard was, deal because uh, here you got this new guy coming in, sitting in the room, and it was Steve Duchesne, and the poor guy, you know, it wasn't his fault he got traded there, and he wasn't exactly embraced when he first got to the team. Yeah, no, the guys told me a story. I think it might have been you telling the story about Channy, like because the, immediately you guys took off to Anaheim, right? And I said, well, I'm staying here. I ain't going. I'm not going to uh, Quebec City. And and uh, so I think you told me the story years later that uh, 
the poor guy's sitting in the room afterwards. Bobby Berry walks in and he starts going on and off about the trade and ranting and we, raving. We didn't want we, this guy. It's not our fault that the the guys, you know, and the poor guy's sitting in the room. You know, it was terrible. But. Yeah, Shani said to Bobby, he's, he's sitting right here, right? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, man, I love sitting down with you as usual, and uh, and it's great, great having you around. Uh, I mean, I know you're gonna have a great night with the captain's night. And uh, we love having you coming on, and I appreciate your time, buddy. Yeah, anytime. You bet, Chaser. All right. That's Garth Butcher here on Chasing Pucks with Panger. We'll be back in a minute. And, folks, listen, uh, today's uh, podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day uh, trial at audiotrial.com slash NHL. Over 180,000 titles to choose from, from your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Back in a minute. Chasing Pucks with Panger. Hey everybody, this is Matt Geiger from the You're on the Clock podcast, and if you love football the way I do, but hate hearing about the -the off-the-field drama that ESPN reports every day, then you need to go to ontheclockpodcast.com as part of Lineup Media Group. We give you the best football content every week, and we don't talk about any off-field drama. And we also do a DraftKings contest weekly where the top two players get to take home some money. So that's, once again, ontheclockpodcast.com. Come check us out and let us know what you think. You're listening to Jason Pang on NHLpodcast.com. Back here with Darren Pang. I'm Kelly Chase, Chasing Pucks with Panger. You sound good, too, on the band. You like the band? The new yeah. band come? The band come in behind us as well. I like this whole ambiance of the, yeah. the, the uh, concert deal going on behind us. And, uh, I'm Amy Grant. Amy Grant. Amy Grant. Scott Trade Center. We are. We are. We're going to uh, we're gonna sit, hey, one more little quick topic. and We had one of the officials. I don't want to bring his name. That's not important. But he got picked up on the crowd mic. And... Uh, it bothered a lot of people. It didn't seem to bother as many people in the hockey arena as it might have. And I know the optics were bad, but one of the officials, and I'm sure we can get the audio and plug it in, one of the officials swore at one of the players. And I want to hear your thoughts on it. To start with. Well, I, my thoughts on it were these players that embellish has got to frustrate the heck out of the referees. Right. So um, I know what happened. I, I know... You know, I know that that player, from what I understand, embarrassed the referee in the first period. Correct. Is that right? Correct. So, and now the referee gets caught by that player, hook, line, and sinker, and now watches, sees it happen again, and boy, before <laughs> before the whistle, anything can go, boom! Oh yeah, that's embellishment. Right, you know, right. That's two minutes. Don't do that again. You're right. going to your room. Right. Going to the field <laughs> it's well, a timeout for you. I know the optics of it were terrible. I guess from the, you know, you got kids. It's a, it's kind of a family show. But I'll tell you what, it happened so much on the ice. He got caught with, got caught with his pants down a little bit with the, with yeah. the mic. And I think you definitely have to be more careful about it. But the, but the players that were watching, it's a unique perspective because the players that were yes. watching, they couldn't care less. They were like, that's what he needed. Tired, we're tired of him doing it. Yep. It was James Neal of the uh, yep. Nashville Predators. Yep. And, uh, and I, again, uh, one of those situations where you're, you're sitting there and you're wondering, oh, my goodness, is he going to get in trouble for what just happened here? And yet yet you 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 hear the guys talk and they're like, who cares? And then when you get down on the you bench. You mean the players? The players yeah, say the players. who cares? Yeah, they don't care about the referee no, saying that or, no, or how no, he said it. No. And if he would have said it in the middle of the ice, there would be no microphone right there. No one would have known what well, he said. Well, the beauty of it is, this happens every game. Yeah, absolutely, it, it happens. This every happened game. to be behind the net where Sometimes they had the microphone right there. Sometimes it's not as right long; and they just catch it. And so now, you know, so the people were, you know, there was a lot of talk about it. And I sort of chuckled a little bit, and I, and I called a couple of our colleagues, and I said, "Hey, where do you stand with this?" And they they were like, "Are you kidding me? We're going to bat for this guy, this official. It's it's a joke. You know, we're we're worried about it." So. Yeah. I was glad to see our fraternity stick behind the officials in this. And you know me, I can be hard on officials, but in this circumstance, I just think when you're playing an emotional game like that and uh, every, every all eyes are on you and, and you make a mistake, you know, like they did not making the first call on the guy, now you're trying to embarrass the official, yeah. 
that's going to get in their crawl space. They're trying to make a living too, so I'm, I'm, so I'm giving them the better. You know what? And, you know what, Chaser? And I, I thought, I thought, and I watched it again, and and uh, again, like you did a little background on it, and I think, um, like. I like the passion of the referee, right? Because I think and we, we don't, need more of a rapport well, with that passion, that, right? I don't think there's enough of that, right? Um, and it's not their fault. Every one of these officials, they're they're good people. They want to be part of it as well. They're part of the National Hockey League. They're referees. They have a a big say in what happens during the course of the game, and they know the players as well as anybody knows the players, right? They know how the players disrespect them or or do something on a faceoff or. Diving is a it, diving is a, such a dishonorable thing. Right. Um, but it's been around now, and it's been allowed to to grow and fester here. Where um, so I, I like when a referee shows that passion like that, and and mm, you know uh, the NHL. They, they, sure, they find the players, but that's not as big of a deal. I mean, we, remember we we started again this year with a list of where. <laughs> We don't know who gets fined or well, well, whatever for embellishment. We, there's, there's no embarrassment to it, it doesn't seem. That's like. the thing. I, so, I think there needs to be more of that. So it's nice that the players back it up. No, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. So we're on the same page on that one, certainly. What a great week. What a great show, buddy. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed good. doing that with you. And, and listen, having Garth Butcher uh, on here. Wasn't that great? Yeah, listen to yeah, that. Yeah, really, really phenomenal stuff. I, I know the fans are going to really love that because that's that's the character hockey, and the stories. Yeah, and, if you're a hockey fan, yeah, how can't you, right? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And he's one of the greatest names in hockey. Garth Butcher. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to go, uh, I got to go, uh, oh, yeah. I got to go, go tune tickle my guitar. A, tickle Amy. No, I'm gonna tickle t- the t- ivory. I'm going to tune my guitar now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a go, cold one with Amy. Go tune something, big boy. <laughs> okay, well, listen, hey man, great work. show. Hey, you, show. what about what about our three calls of the week? Yeah, we got them coming up. Uh, yeah. Fit in there, our three calls There's of the some week. some good ones, huh? Three calls of the week are fantastic. You're going to hear them as we bust you out here on NHLpodcast.com. Chasing bucks with Banger. Listen up. Our three calls of the week. Now it's Kyle Oposo for the Islanders. And he scores. Nice play by Kyle Oposo, who goes four for five in the shootout this season. Terrific move by Kyle Oposo. Almost the same move as Giroux was attempted. Kyle coming in a little slower than Giroux. Not as many fakes, just a couple of quick ones, and then pulls it back. And then up and right into the toy department. A terrific effort by Kyle Oposo. Elliott has a chance in the offensive zone. The goalie Smith ice it. Play stays in the zone. Great pass by Laterra. I mean, a phenomenal pass by Laterra. Everyone's puck watching. Works it in to Duncan Keith. There goes Kruger to the net. Keith a shot. Right on out of the save by Rena. It's loose. It's good. The Hawks have scored. The rebound goal tap to Patrick Kane's going to extend his streak. And the Hawks down 3 1. Well, what a great play by the Blackhawks. And you see Pecorine very upset. They went to the net hard. And it looks like Marcus Kruger knocks this free. Well, the Predators now trying to buy some time, hoping that the war room in Toronto will extend the time available to look at this play again. Coach's challenge with interference. Right. So he did yeah. indicate, indicate uh, a timeout to be called. That's the way you signal for a coach's challenge. And they're going to uh, say that their goalie was interfered with. Because it was good goal on the ice, unless this is goaltender interference, it'll stand. And let's listen to the call. This is Gord Dwyer will inform us. Upon further video review, the puck is loose on the play. Chicago gets a loose puck into the net. Mm-hmm. On the ice stands. That's the loose of the timeout. That's a right call. This has been Chasing Pucks with Panger, a lineup media group production. Find the show online at NHLpodcast.com, plus on iTunes, Stitcher, and all major podcast outlets. Get access to all of the lineup media group shows at lineupmediagroup.com.